Spirit, use and overrule my words and all our thoughts so that your word alone may be spoken and your word alone heard through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, good morning. morning. What a joyous day and what a privilege for my wife Meg and me to be with you on this great day of of dedication and celebration. You all have been through quite a year. But how good is our God? I just praise the Lord for your uh, faithfulness and prayerfulness and perseverance and courage as you have walked through this season uh, following the Lord as he has led you every step of the way. Uh, We have so uh, been blessed by your witness all across our Anglican movement as we've seen and heard what God has been doing through you all. It is a tremendous uh, joy to to be here this day and to celebrate how God has has led you through and led you into this wonderful uh, new facility. And I want publicly to uh, praise the Lord and give thanks for the leadership of your rector. Um, Thank you, Lord. (laughs) Rob and I, I praise God for you. I thank you for your uh, friendship over many years and partnership in the gospel, but uh, most particularly for your uh, love and faithful leadership of God's people. Uh, You have been a man of great faith as you have kept uh, your eye on Jesus as you have uh, walked in obedience to him and led your people to, to trust him more. And the Lord has really blessed your, your leadership in so many ways. Thank you for your love of God's word. Thank you for your, your, your heart as a pastor for, for God's people. Thank you for all that you have been and done and continue to be for, for this congregation and really for our, whole, for our whole movement. And I praise God for, uh, for your, uh, your team your growing clergy team, or my, for which my wife and I are especially thankful, uh, <laughs> as, and, and the, the wonderful staff team that you have. I keep telling you they all make you look really good, Robin. <laughs> uh, but to Dennis and the vestry um, and the extraordinary lay leadership of this, this congregation, you have been so faithful, so courageous, so persevering uh, through all of these years. Uh, I just bless you for your for your leadership. You all are so faithfully and wisely led, and I know you know that. But uh, to God be the glory for all that He's doing in this wonderful congregation. I also bring you greetings from Archbishop Bob Duncan, the Anglican Church in North America. I was on the phone with him this week, and he sends his love and and greetings to you all as you celebrate this this great day. 1,300 years before the birth of Jesus, God spoke to his people through Moses, the lawgiver. At Mount Sinai, in addition to giving the Ten Commandments, God gave something else. He gave his very presence. When Moses went up on the mountain, the glory of the Lord, the presence of God, settled on the mountain like a cloud filled with fire. You see, God, who is spirit, is everywhere, but he manifests his presence from time to time. He shows himself in certain places. When God showed his awesome presence and glory there at Mount Sinai, he made a promise to his people. He said he would stay with them. He would continue to manifest his glory among them. And they were to build a place of worship. And there God would dwell among his people. At first, the place of worship was a tent, which they could pick up and move as they wandered in the desert. When they built that tent of worship and dedicated it, the glory of the Lord filled it. God's awesome presence was so overwhelmingly powerful that Moses couldn't even enter the tent. God had come to his people. Later, after the Israelites had entered the promised land, God instructed them through King Solomon to 
replaced the worship tent with a temple built of stone. And when the temple was completed, it too was dedicated. And again, God's presence and glory came and filled the temple with such power and majesty that the priests couldn't even enter it. God was still present among his people. But God's people didn't honor his presence among them. They didn't live in obedience to his commandments. They turned away from the Lord and they rebelled against him. In their sin, they worshiped false gods. They oppressed the poor. They were unfaithful in their marriages. They persecuted and killed God's messengers, the prophets. But instead of being sorry for their sins, the people of Israel were spiritually smug and complacent. They said, we have God's glory. We have his very presence among us in the temple. And so nothing bad can happen to us. No foreign army could possibly harm us. We are protected because of the glory of the Lord. But God's righteous judgment on their sin was soon to come. The mighty Babylonian army invaded and besieged Jerusalem and captured it about 600 B.C., and many of the leading citizens were forced into exile. They were sent off hundreds of miles to the east to Babylon. One of those who was taken prisoner and exiled was the prophet Ezekiel. One day while Ezekiel was praying, God gave him a vision of such awesomeness that it would strike terror in the hearts of everyone who heard it. Ezekiel saw a vision of the glory of God rising up and leaving the temple in Jerusalem. God showed him in a vision what would soon take place. God was going to leave his people. God was going to depart from his dwelling place on earth. God would withdraw his glory and his presence from his people. What God showed Ezekiel is indeed what happened. The Babylonian army returned to Jerusalem, destroyed the city, burned the temple to the ground. It seemed that all was lost. But in a glorious message of promise and of hope, God gave to Ezekiel another vision, a vision of the return of the glory of the Lord to a renewed and restored temple. God wasn't finished with his people. Even though his people had abandoned him, God remembered his people and he remembered his promises to them. Well, after generations in captivity, God caused the exiled Jews to be released. They returned to Jerusalem and they began to rebuild the temple. But what they built this time wasn't anything like as grand and glorious as the former temple. And when the older people, the ones who remembered the earlier temple, saw the new one, they wept. It was clear to them just how far down God's people had sunk. But much worse, when they dedicated this new temple, the glory of the Lord didn't come in. The glory and presence of the Lord didn't fill the temple as it had with Moses in the tent in the desert and in the temple under King Solomon. No, this time, the glory of the Lord did not come to dwell with them. But then God surprised them. God spoke to his people and said a strange thing. God said through the prophet Haggai that the glory of this new temple would be greater than the glory of the old temple that had been destroyed. And in it, God would give his peace. In the words that are sung at the start of Handel's Messiah, the prophet Haggai gave this declaration from God. He said, this is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and the desired of all nations, that's the Messiah, the desired of all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. And here's the key. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant 
Now, to the people who were rebuilding the temple, that made no sense. The new temple was a pitiful attempt at restoring the building's former greatness. The nation had been decimated, and there was no way they could hope to recapture the glory of those previous centuries. But you see, when God promised that the glory of the new temple would surpass the old temple, he wasn't talking about architecture. He wasn't talking about square footage or stone carvings or gold leaf. His glory was going to come among his people in a greater way than ever before. The glory of the new temple was going to be greater not because of how it was made, but because of who would be in it. And so the people waited. They waited for the promise to be fulfilled. The prophet Malachi at the end of the Old Testament renewed the people's expectation when he gave this promise from the Lord. He said, see, I will send my messenger who will go prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. That was the promise. The Lord would suddenly come to his temple, but not yet. And so for centuries, they waited. About 20 B.C., King Herod the Great began to build yet another temple, this one vastly bigger and more ornate than the one constructed by those returning exiles. But as big as it was, as magnificent as it was, it still lacked the most important thing. The glory of the Lord did not come in. And then one night, Angels appeared to some shepherds in the fields near the town of Bethlehem and announced the coming of the glory of the Lord. God had come in the most unexpected of ways. God's glory had not come in fire. God's glory had not come in a cloud. But God himself in his glory had come as a little baby. God had been born among us as one of us, Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. God incarnate, God in the flesh, the all-encompassing, all-surpassing glory of the infinite God come to us in human form, Jesus. The The angels announced his birth and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They brought good news of great joy. A Savior has been born. He is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Then 40 days later, the baby Jesus was brought into the temple. The Jewish law stipulated that mothers who had given birth were to bring their infants into the temple and present them to the Lord. Baby boys were to be presented exactly 40 days after birth. And so, in obedience to God's word, Mary and Joseph went with the baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem, that temple rebuilt yet again, but into which the glory of the Lord had not yet entered. It was a quiet event, observed only by a few, but it was of cosmic significance for every person on the planet, including you and me. The infant Jesus was brought by Mary and Joseph into the temple. Get it? The rebuilt temple, which had not yet had the promised glory of God returned to it, now has Jesus, the radiance of God's glory, enter in. There in the temple, Mary and Joseph encountered a man named Simeon, a godly, righteous man. Simeon had been praying and waiting in the temple for a long time, perhaps years, because God had told him that he wouldn't die until he had seen the long-awaited Messiah. And when the baby Jesus was brought into the temple, Simeon saw him. And Simeon, moved by the Holy Spirit, realized that Jesus was the one he'd been waiting for. And he cried out, God, you've done what you promised. Now at last I have your peace because I've seen your salvation and your glory has come to your people, Israel. There in the form of a baby was the glory of God, God in human form. 
God had fulfilled his promise. He'd come to his people and he would now live among them. The glory of God was there in the person of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And the glory of this rebuilt temple was far greater than the old temple because God himself was there in Jesus. God had come to his people in a new and far greater way. God had come to them as one of them. This new church is a wonderful facility, a gift of God who is ever faithful to his promises. It will be a tremendous instrument of the mission of this congregation as you reach out into this community with the transforming love of Jesus. But what matters most is the presence and power and glory of the Lord. We dedicate this place today. It is sacred space, holy to the Lord, the new church of the epiphany. But as you know, epiphany means manifestation. And if the Lord is to manifest his presence among you, you must be a people devoted to him, a people who seek his face, who delight in the glory of the Lord, and then who reflect his glory in the beauty of holiness. Back when Moses first constructed that tent of meeting in the wilderness and the glory of the Lord came and dwelt there, God gave to Moses specific directions about coming into his presence. And one of the commands concerned a special perfumed oil, which was to be put on all of the holy vessels, the Ark of the Covenant and the table and the altars and all the rest. And that oil was to be put on Aaron the priest and on his successors. That special perfumed oil was unique, and no one was to make any oil like it. It was holy to the Lord. In addition, God directed that there was to be a special perfumed incense, which was to burn in front of the ark, God's throne, where he promised he would meet with those he called into his presence. No one was to duplicate that incense. It was holy to the Lord. As a result, when Moses or Aaron or in later years, the appointed high priest would come out from the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, there would be a fragrance about his person. He would carry with him the sweet and unmistakable smell of the presence of God. Holiness is like that. Holiness is the sweet fragrance about a person who has been in intimate communion with God. Holiness is the aroma of the presence of the Lord. There is to be that same sweet fragrance of the Lord's presence about us who are Jesus' disciples. In Acts chapter 4, when the Sanhedrin was persecuting Peter and John for telling others about Jesus, it says that the members of the councils were astonished at their courage and their message. But then the passage adds very significantly, it says they took note that these men had been with Jesus. That same aroma, if you will, hung about the disciples. They had spent time in Jesus' presence, listening to his word, praying, following him, enjoying intimate fellowship, and others noticed it. Holiness is the fragrance of intimacy with Jesus. Holiness cannot be manufactured. It cannot be produced by our own striving in the flesh. We must allow God to put to death our worldly nature on the cross daily. And as we yield to him, we will more and more learn to love prayer. We will learn to love the word of God. We will learn to love our neighbors as ourselves. We will learn to love the presence of God. This is the doorway to holiness because only in surrender do we come into God's presence. Only in spirit-led devotion, which seeks only God and not ourselves, will we take on the fragrance of the Lord becoming more holy, more and more like Jesus. Holiness is his work in us. It is the fragrance of intimacy 
with Jesus. My friends, never forget that the true glory of Church of the Epiphany is found in the presence of Jesus. May His glory always be among you as you gather here. And may His glory be upon you like a sweet fragrance as you go out to share Jesus with a world that needs Him so very much.